Hal Jordan's attempt to escape Amanda Waller's prison on Gamora Island continues while the JSA enlists an unlikely ally for help. What's a Green Lantern to do when his ring is out of power? Let's find out in our review of Green Lantern number 14 from DC Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Green Lantern number four. Wowie wow wow. Let's just make up a name for Jeremy Adams and just call him something like, I don't know, Lemon Master. Because the quality of entertainment he's squeezing out of absolute power should make his fellow DC writers pucker up their sour faces with envy. Is Green Lantern number four perfect? No. But Adams makes the most out of the tie-in and pushes his own story forward by loading every square inch with importance and meaning. Before we dig into the current issue, let's recap what happened to Hal Jordan in Green Lantern number 13. Hal escaped captivity and torture at the hands of Amanda Waller's minions. This is still a absolute power tie-in. When Hal worked his way through the Gamora Island prison, he discovered a huge cache of weaponry that Waller had confiscated from Earth's heroes and villains. So Hal may have discovered the gold mine to get him out of trouble, but we'll see. So that brings us to the current issue, Green Lantern number 14. We pick up immediately after the ending of issue number 13. Hal is running around Gamora Island prison looking for a way to escape and get his ring back. He sees it among the weaponry in a small box, but the stormtroopers that Waller uses to keep all the equipment in check and keep all the prisoners online are guarding it pretty closely. Hal creates a small distraction with the help of one of Toy Man's tops, which explodes in a little flashbang distraction. He knocks out one of the guards and gets his ring back. I'm going to say right off the bat, I like what Jeremy Adams is doing with Hal Jordan. He uses his courage and smarts to gain an advantage, hopefully to get back into superhero shape. That said, the last issue and the start of this one only work if Gamora Island has the worst security in the world, because it's hard not to notice a shirtless guy running around down the hallways. So it's a little bit of a quibble, but it's one that kind of makes sense in the context. The issue then cuts over to Alan Scott, who we last saw willingly giving himself up to Jade Stone, one of the Amazo robots in Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 3. We now know Jade Stone took Scott to the Gamora Island prison as well. Scott and Jade Stone are playing chess in his cell, discussing the philosophical potential of free will, an after effect of Jade Stone absorbing the star heart energy from Alan Scott in that previous issue. The absorption of the heart stone may have given Jade Stone free will, and Alan Scott is trying to play up that advantage, trying to turn him over to the hero's side. But suddenly, Jade Stone excuses himself when he hears the alarm set off by Hal's actions in the loading bay. Here, we start to see those little seeds planted in Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 3 continue to play out. When Jade Stone absorbed the Star Heart energy, Jeremy Adams planted that seed that said, oh, okay, an amazing robot can be corrupted, could be turned over, could be given free will, and then maybe possibly turned into the hero side of things. Scott smartly nurtures that seed with the hope that it will pay off. And he uses that by playing chess, talking about free will, talking about how we make choices and not just respond to pre-programming. Jade Stone's conversion is probably the most interesting thread in this entire tie-in and possibly the larger context of the event. The comic then switches back to Hal. He's still being pursued by Waller's stormtroopers and he breaks open every case within reach to use whatever weapons he can find to fend off the stormtroopers long enough to escape. His ring is back in his possession but it doesn't have any power so he's got to find a way to get back to the battery to charge it. Just when he thinks he might have a chance by throwing guns, weapons, spears, boomerangs, whatever he can find, Jade Stone arrives to quickly capture him. The issue changes over again to a new scene where we catch up with Carol Ferris and the still free members of the JSA inside the Tower of Fate. The JSA knows that they need help by growing their numbers, trying to get in touch with other heroes, maybe forming a united front, but they know they'll get captured within minutes if they leave the tower. What's their solution? They turn their attention to Carol Ferris, who probably is not under Amanda Waller's watchful eye. They believe that if she goes out there, nobody's going to be looking for her, so she has the best chance of getting in contact with the other heroes to bring them back to the tower. As much as we like what's going on with Jade Stone and his or its possible corruption, Carol's scene with the JSA is one of the highlights of this issue. Her wide-eyed wonder at sitting with a team of superheroes inside of a magic tower reminds readers that superhero comics are supposed to be hopeful. They're supposed to be optimistic. They're supposed to be fun. If Carol decides to become a star sapphire full-time as a takeaway from this experience, I think it would be a welcome change. The comic switches again to a new scene, but with good reason. 
Now we head off to the Great Hall of Oa, where Tharos holds a meeting with the Council. Tharos' allies are concerned about how Jordan's recent attack, and that's in the previous issue before Absolute Power started, but Tharos assures them that Hal has been neutralized thanks to his alliance with Amanda Waller. Members of the Council grumble that their world would become the target of a multi-planet offensive if it was discovered that all the ambassadors were replaced with shape-shifting Durlands. Theros tells his brethren not to be concerned because he intends to lead his force to a total takeover of the galaxy. Even though this scene feels like it has nothing to do with absolute power, it's still important. Jeremy Adams inserts the scene, but smartly plants intriguing seeds for the series after absolute power ends. So even though this is a tie-in, Adams finds a way to sort of organically keep the original Green Lantern series flowing through the course of the event. It's clear Theros' fellow shapeshifters do not share his lust for totalitarian authority, so there's a key hint right there, and the Durlands may not be so loyal to him for very long if he keeps pushing as hard as he's pushing. The issue cuts back to Hal in the Gamoran prison. It seems like we're doing a lot of switching around and moving back and forth, but it flows very well. Without a ring that has power, Hal is no match for Jade Stone. He tries to run, firing every weapon he can get his hands on, but nothing works. Out of desperation, Hal picks up and aims a stick at Jade Stone, and he calls it a stick because he doesn't know what it is. Fortunately for Jade Stone, but fortunately for Hal, the stick is Abracadabra's wand. After a massive explosion, Jade Stone concludes Hal was vaporized, but in reality, Hal just gave himself and his allies a huge boost. The issue ends with Christmas coming early, sort of. You can sort of guess what's happening there. An undercover mission, which is going to be interesting to find out. And Tears of Sorrow and Anger. And that, again, harkens back to the main Green Lantern title. Overall, Jeremy Adams packs in gobs of twists, turns, and cool developments in this issue to expand what's happening in the main Absolute Power event and make progress on the main Green Lantern series at the same time. That's quite a balancing act, so kudos to Adams for another entertaining comic, and probably one of the better issues in Absolute Power overall. Let's switch gears just for a little bit and talk about the art. Fernando Passerin and Eau Claire Albert deliver a pitch-perfect set of visuals with action, adventure, heart, and a little bit of humor, but appropriately placed humor. The figure work, facial acting, and action all look great together, and Romulo Fajardo Jr.'s coloring is 100% on point. We don't often talk about the backups, at least not in the video reviews, but in this case, there's something here that might be noteworthy for the future. Mark Guggenheim delivers another one-off story that centers on a Green Lantern named Shint de Proba. I think I'm saying that right. Shint was honored to become a Green Lantern when the Power Ring chose him after its previous owner died, but he soon came to suspect that the Ring no longer chooses bearers based on nobility and honor and will and all the things that you expect, but on the likelihood of their compliance to Theros, who's manipulating the rings. After possessing the ring for a while, Shint becomes a member of Theros' Shadow Lanterns, but he suspects that the ring bearers of the Shadow Lanterns are being manipulated by Theros and are not the best quality people. So he hatches a plan to be rid of Theros' manipulative influence and hopefully ensure his ring passes to a truly worthy successor. Mark Guggenheim's tale of quiet dissension within Theros' ranks is perfectly serviceable, and the art is, eh, to be frank, decent enough. That said, the real kicker of the story is the suggestion that a new lantern will be joining the core, but one that comes from very far away and without Theros' manipulation. So we don't know who that lantern is going to be, or if it's going to be somebody who sticks around for a while, but that suggestion is there and it's waiting to pay off. Final thoughts, what do we think about Green Lantern number 14? It's one of the strongest tie-ins to Absolute Power because Jeremy Adams gives you plenty of cool developments. You get action, excitement, and adventure, and he still finds a way to organically work in the plot of the main Green Lantern series to keep the whole thing moving forward. There isn't a bad spot or a bad scene in this comic that we can find, and the art team delivers on all fronts. Therefore, Green Lantern number 14 earns an 8.8 .8 out of 10. Jeremy Adams not only shows how to do tie-ins the right way, but he may even be outdoing Mark Wade on the main event. Just putting that out there. What do you think? Are you enjoying Absolute Power so far, including the tie-ins? Give us a thumbs up if you are, or leave a comment below if you think Absolute Power is an absolute dud. Some people may think that way. Also remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. Your support would be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.